Welcome to another episode of What's the Hype Podcast. The building. Got an interception, and you're not down by 10 anymore. Andre Howe, his you second know, interception. Right. To get you the information that you need is when you start your own business and do your own thing. And I felt like it gave me a good perspective. I was not the first person to go through what I went through. Welcome to another episode of What's the Hype Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Pope, a.k.a. The Pod Disciple. I'm Nicole Andre Howe. Man, we're back again with another episode. I'm not going to uh, belabor this any longer and, you know, kind of talk about, you know, the things that um, we are excited about when it comes to this episode. Uh, but we'll be able to really dive into it on this episode. I'm so excited. This young man um, b- being able to, to talk to us, Dre, from a different perspective. Right. A lot of times we've had guests on, you know, had the success when you talk about sports and uh, making it pro and those different things. But this is a different lane that we're talking about. So I'm excited about this. So um, today joining us, we'll have uh, Warner Robins native, uh, Northside High School alum, two-time All-County, two-time All-Region, top 10 in high school history and yards per catch, 2002 preseason all Act, 2004 team co-captain, current vice president, and Chief Operating Officer for Methodist Mansfield Medical Center. With no further ado, we want to welcome to the podcast, Mr. Patrick Brown. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, what's going on, guys? How you doing? Doing great, man. All is well. Patrick, we, uh, again, I'm just excited, man, to have you on this podcast um, because not only do you have uh, athletic success, but you're talking about a space in which not many of our uh, guests have been able to really talk to or talk about. Mm-hmm. So we're just excited about that. Um, I know you're familiar with our podcast. So again, we like to go beyond the hype, go beyond the hype of sports and really give like real life tangible lessons and things that young people can learn and take from and be able to apply to their journey and their process as they try to navigate sports and life in general. So again, man, thank you for joining us. No, no problem. Uh, thanks for having me. No question. So we'll jump right into it, Patrick, right? Uh, just Warner Robins, tell us a little bit about what it was like growing up um, and, you know, what it was like for you growing up uh, there in Warner Robins. Yeah. So for those of you who don't know, Warner Robins, a uh, small town. Well, not necessarily. I don't think of a small town, small town <laughs> in, uh, in, in middle Georgia. It's about an hour south of Atlanta. So if you look at a map, you know, it's kind of uh, called the heart of Georgia. And we actually moved there by way of the military. So my father is in the army. So my first nine years of life, um, I was born in Fort Benning. We moved to Germany, Michigan, Kentucky. Wow. And then uh, we, we moved back to or moved to Georgia when I was nine. So I was like in the finishing up third grade. And it was uh, either moved back there or moved to Brantonton, Florida, which is where my, where, where my dad is from, near the Tampa, Sarasota area. Mm-hmm. So so we moved we moved to Warner Robins, got there in what, this was the early 90s, 92, um, in third grade. And... Uh, I mean, it was it was a cool upbringing. Um, had a lot of had a lot of you know friends. Um, good 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 community environment. We you know fell into our church home there, and um, and sports was was huge. I mean, for you know for it to be small town, everything was uh, uh, evolved around sports. I mean, so that that was that was really key, and I, and I found that out pretty quick as soon as we touched down and went around. Small town, some that's something Drake can uh, relate to being from Port Allen. He can yeah. definitely relate to small yeah. town. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and it's funny because you know, um, I just get, give a little more context on it. So, Warner Robins, um, then it was probably population about 75,000, 75, um, 90,000, uh, 75 to, to 85,000. I used to say, um, you know, because I you know, went to Bethune Cookman, it was it reminded me of the size of Daytona a little bit, but without the beach. <laughs> So you know, imagine that in the in middle of Georgia, and you pretty much got one of Robins. So, uh, when did you first start playing sports? Which sport, and who inspired you early on? So the first sport I played was actually t-ball, <laughs> t-ball baseball. Um, when I think we were living in Michigan at the time, and so I started playing baseball. Then I played soccer, then I played, and I kind of segued into basketball. I didn't play football until uh, I played flag football when I was uh, eight. Um, and when we were living in Kentucky, then we, when we moved to Georgia, um, after that first fall there, that's when I started playing tackle football. Um, and <clears throat> so probably my first few years, it was just whatever season it was, it was, you know, it's, it's time to play. So my dad, you know, he's um, big, you know, he's from Florida. So he's big. He's Florida fan of everything. 
the Gators, Florida State. I mean, they could be playing anybody. He's he liked the Bucks when the Bucks were horrible, when they had the highlight of orange stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so I, I really learned just the foundation of, of playing sports and the love of sports through him first. And then I think the, the pivotal moment for me personally came when um, I had an older cousin who uh, went to Brentonton Southeast. Uh, some of you may know that's the high school that uh, Peter Ward is yeah. from. So he was actually Peter Ward's teammate in high school. So I remember when we moved to Georgia, we would drive down to Florida and see him, see that team play. And this was 93. So that year they were the number one ranked team in the nation. So, you know, back then for people who probably don't remember, it, back then, if you were ranked number one, that was like through uh, USA Today, number mm -hmm. one. And mm -hmm. Now you got like 20,000 different polls now, but then it was just one. USA Today, you open up the paper on Tuesdays, Wednesdays and see who see the ranking. So they were number one. And he was the number four ranked defensive back in, in the nation at the time. So he was like second team parade All-American when, when that, um, I guess, meant a whole lot more back then. And I remember visiting him and just, just seeing the, the, the shoe boxes of letters from, you know, Bobby Bowden and Joe Paterno. Um, he had he had letters from USC, handwritten letters from coaches at Kansas State. And it, it was looking through his eyes. That's when I started to realize, like, like maybe I can I, I think I could do something with this, you know, long term. And um, like, a, I think a, a quick story I want to give about him is, uh, well, his name is uh, Charlie Brown, but we call him Chuck. And um, he actually took me to my first college football game, and that was Florida, Florida State in 93. So Florida State had Ward Dunn, yeah. was a running back. I think that was his freshman year. That was Charlie Ward's last year. Derrick Brooks was a linebacker. Uh, the Gators had uh, Eric Rett at running back. Mm -hmm. um, they had some good receivers there. And, and that, that, that's probably the loudest game I've ever been to in my life, even to this day. So that's what through my cousin Chuck. That's where I started to get the uh, the idea that, like, you know what? I think I can make make you know football. I can make something out of this football thing, and that's when I just kind of kind of locked in on football as my sport. Well, that's a heck of a first game to go to when you talk about Florida, Florida State rivalry at that time. Bobby Bow and Steve Spurrier, you yep. know, both of those guys won national championships in the '90s, so they had those team court guys on those teams. So I can just even imagine the atmosphere at that time. I mean, it was, I mean, I remember we drove up, I remember this day like vividly, we drove up that morning from, 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 from Brainton, about a three hour drive. And we were walking on campus, my first time on a college campus. And I remember I looked over to, I guess a dorm room and there was like, like this guy, he was knocked out and he had a girl on this arm, a girl on this arm and beer can in each hand. <laughs> it was like 1030. And I was like, what? I'm, I'm, I'm like 10. Yeah. Like, what? <laughs> and then we we walk into Ben Hill Griffith Stadium and, and he they had the whole spread laid out. All the recruits had the like name tags, had our um our, our, our hostesses or my, my cousin's hostesses, and they were like, you know, get whatever you want to eat. You know, as a 10 year old, I'm like, I can I can get all this. I just I took <laughs> everything. And we went down to the field. It, it was it was amazing. Wow. So so where did he end up going to school? So he, he signed with uh Pitt. Um, Pitt Panthers. Okay. And there's a whole there's a whole story on that because um, uh, he was we all thought he was going to the Gators. We thought that was a foregone conclusion. And then I think at the last minute he 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 made a decision to go to Pitt. I think it was uh, his girlfriend now wife at the time. She went to she was the year ahead of him. She went to Howard, and he wanted to be closer to her. But he also wanted to kind of chart his own path since everyone thought he was going to Florida, and so he wound up going to uh, to Pitt. He, he had a decent career, but he, he didn't make it to the league or anything. But but uh, I, I think he was happy with his choice. Right. Right. Well, I mean, again, those 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 little moments, as you said, just kind of open your eyes to the opportunity and what college life is like. So um, as we talk about again, uh, tell us a little bit about just your team in high school, Northside uh, High School. Talk about a little bit about your individual success and team success while you're in high school. Yeah, so so my team uh, now, if you if you know anything about Georgia football, uh, Northside High School is probably one of the top powerhouses in, in the mm -hmm. state now. But if you if you go back to early '90s when I got there, the big dog in Georgia was Warner Robins, which is our rival. So the, by that time, the Demons Warner Warner Robins Demons they had a national championship from the '70s. Um, they won like three or four state championships in the '80s, and they were routinely going to like you know the, the semifinals or finals or quarterfinals every, every year. So Northside was pretty much like the you know the, the stepbrother in town. Um, so I was a freshman in '97. The, the year before, my, which was my eighth grade year in 96, um, Northside beat Warner Robins, which was the first time in like 10 years. So that's when the tide started to shift. 
So after that, um, after my freshman year, we I think that's what started kind of the dynasty of of, of, of Northside uh, football, and we had a uh, we had a heck of a lot of talent that came through there. And then for me, by the time I got there, I thought I was going to be quarterback, you know, because I, I played quarterback in rec league. Um, I played both ways, quarterback and wide receiver and DB in middle school. So I was like, you know, this this is going to be easy. So I mean, they invited me to come to. Uh, two a days uh, when I was a rising freshman, I was it was like me and like two others. So I was like, yeah, like you know, I'm, I'm all in. Mm-hmm. So so halfway through my freshman season, I was playing like freshman and JV ball. They moved me to wide receiver. At the time, I t- I, I took that as an insult because at Northside, if you were you know all the um, the previous athletes or the good players were either quarterbacks, running backs, or or secondary players. Nobody from Northside was a wide receiver that did anything. I mean, and we didn't even really throw the ball at the time. So I was like, man, this is, they're, they're putting me out the pasture. So at that point, that's when I started to realize, I was like, you know, Patrick, I could either, uh, I could either like, you know, um, close up shop or I could just try to make the best out of playing wide receiver. And then just so happens my sophomore year, we started to get more balanced in the offensive, uh, offensive game plan. So we started throwing the ball more. Um, in practice, I started making some plays, um, and then I started to get some more respect from, you know, um, I guess the the, the 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 defensive players on the team, and I was just I just kept, you know, making plays in practice to the point where I, you know, I get to my junior year, um, make sec- I think like second team all county, uh, all region, um, senior year make first team all county all region, and I think what's what people probably don't know the, those who know my you know my story and my history is that. Um, uh, so for Northside, we we were dominant during those years. So we were routinely the starters. We never really played a full game because by the time we got to the third quarter, it was like forty-five to nothing. They mm-hmm. pulled the starters out. Yeah. And whenever we did have competitive games as a wide receiver, we everybody in the state knew when we were going to throw the ball. It was third and long. Everybody knew it. So um, so all that said, whenever we did throw the ball, it was like, you know, a hundred dog getting crumbs. It was like, you know, when they throw the ball, you got to catch it. Cause you know, I, I may not get another target for like two weeks. <laughs> so, so if you look at my stats, um, I even reflected on this. It's, it's amazing that I even got kind of seen because my junior year, I had 10 catches, 220 yards, three touchdowns, but I probably only had 11 targets. I'm counting overthrows. That 11th target was an overthrow. And my senior year, I had 18 catches, 375 uh, yards, five touchdowns, and I think I had 20, 20 or 21 targets. So my whole high school career, I probably only had 35 targets. Wow. And I had, had to do what I had to do with what I had. So um, so you, you factor that in with you know the, the, the powerhouse of the team I was on. Uh, when I got the ball or whenever it came to me, I tried to do the most I could with it. And then one other one other thing I could throw on too, uh, which kind of highlights it even more, is during my junior and senior year, uh, you know, back then I think they still do it now. We used to go to these uh, camps, um, college camps. It really wasn't seven on seven. It was just like you know me and maybe five other people from my team. We would go to Auburn. We went to Florida. Went to University of Georgia. Um, Clemson. Went to all these places. Every camp I went to, I was I always got best receiver out of all camps. Um, I, I remember when I went to Florida camp, uh, I made a, I think I ran like a post corner on, on some, some kid from somewhere. I, I, I never remember the names. I ran a post corner on some, on somebody. I caught it over my shoulder and everybody, the whole camp stopped. Everyone just started clapping. And, and Steve Spurrier walked, walked from the sideline, pulled me out of practice, pulled me out of the drills. And he just sat me down. We just talked the rest of that, that session. I didn't do anything else the rest of that day. So when that happened, in my mind, I was I, I I I thought back to when I went to that game in Florida with my cousin. I was like, yeah, I'm I'm coming to Gainesville. I like I'm coming. I'm like, first sit me down, like just 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 give me the offer. I'm saying yes, yes, yes. And um, you know, the same thing happened at, at at Clemson. Same thing happened at UGA. And um, and I could get into some of it later, but you know, th- th- those particular offers didn't come. But I, I can I can talk more about that. But but yeah, it's uh my, my high school my high school career was it was fun. I enjoyed it. Um, I tried to make the most of the opportunities I was given. And um, yeah. Wow. That's that's amazing. I mean, having similar, um, not necessarily high school, but, but definitely on a college level. Um, and we both played for the same system. So I definitely mm-hmm. understand what you're, you're referring to. Um, but no, that's that that's that's even more um, 
even more of, of an understanding of that experience for you and just even the opportunities that I present. But um, that's 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 amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like on my high school team, I probably should, I should say this, too. Like we had <clears throat> we had a lot of talent coming through. I think I mentioned that earlier, but we had a lot of uh, college coaches that came through all the time. So the class two classes before me. So my, I think when I was a sophomore, that senior class, we had a linebacker who was all American. He went to North Carolina State. He's now he's a strength coach for, for strength coach for North Carolina State now, Antonio Burnett. The next year, we had um, an all American uh, offensive lineman. He played at University of Tennessee, Jason Resford. We had um, D lineman play for University of Georgia. D lineman played for University of Florida. Had a secondary safety play for Florida State. I mean, our our our, our, our uh, during our practices, it was just like ten. It was like Tennessee, Notre Dame, Washington. I mean, we had all these coaches out there, and so I was like, you know, I got to do something with what you know any any opportunity I get. So I, I got some some interest, but um, you know, at that at that time, and even now, I think it was more stat driven. They wanted mm-hmm. to see the numbers more so than what talent you actually have. Right. And um, and that really came became true to me. I'll tell you. I'll tell you this one quick story. Um, when I went to Clemson camp, um, you know, this this kind of kind of dates me a little bit. But during that time, you know, we didn't have YouTube and social media, so you just heard people's names. Mm-hmm. You couldn't really kind of like look them up and see who they were, what they did, or whatnot. But this one year, this was like summer two thousand. There was a rumor that it was this all American wide receiver who was coming to camp, and uh, I can say his name. His name's uh, Ty Tamir Zimmerman. And um, I remember when we, I got to camp, we were we like running our sessions. Um, you know, and I, I was, I was, just, I was killing, I was killing these kids from, you know, from Georgia, South Carolina, from all over, was killing them. So kids coming up to me, they're like, you know, hey, are, are you, are you Tom Arizona? And I'm like, nah, nah. And I had found out who it was before they were asking me, and I pointed to the dude. I was like, yeah, he's that's Tom Arizona. And all I can say is that, you know, I, I mean, I don't know what what happened leading up to camp or who we played against or whatever, but I just remember when I think All American, I'm thinking like, like you. You killing it, and when yes. I and what I what I saw, I was like, you want you you wouldn't even you wouldn't even be my backup in, wow. in, in my high school. So, but I was just like, you know, that's when I knew some of the rankings and some of these things are were kind of biased depending mm-hmm. on who you who 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 the who the player knew or who the coach of the player knew. So it, it, it that was just eye opening to me because you know coming out of Georgia, I was like, you know, if you if you're if you're the you know the dog or if you're the, the, the top dog, and then I'm expecting to see something, and I just didn't see it that particular that particular time, and others thought it was me. So, wow, no, that's that's the, I, you know, that's been the story, and I'm sure Dre got stories and ref, same thing in terms of you know people that get a lot of notoriety for whatever reason, right? Whether it be, you know, a lot of times it, it used to be camps where it used to give guys a lot of attention. And then once they put the pads on, it's a different story, right? So it's when just... Those, when those bullets start flying, <laughs> it's different. Talk about your recruiting process and why you decided why you decide to go to Bethune-Cookman University. So my, my recruitment process wasn't as robust as I thought it was going to be, particularly with some of the um, um, notoriety I guess I was getting throughout the the uh, camp circuit. So by the time my senior year rolls around, at least like locally or, or or I guess regionally, people knew my name and they knew that I, what type of player I was, but I wasn't getting like a lot of like offers like I thought. Um, the most interest I got as the as my senior year went on, I started to get a lot of interest from University of Louisville and uh, Middle Tennessee State were kind of the, the like, like the two bigger you know bigger names um, that recruited me. So uh, at the last minute, uh, Middle Tennessee State, which I give him credit to this day, that the coach came to my school and he told me face to face that they were going to be um, um, recruiting or focusing their recruitment efforts on two other wide receivers, and I was I was number three on that list. And when they got those commitments from those two wide receivers, they were gonna uh, discontinue my recruitment. And then, I mean, to this day, I mean, I, I mean, he looked me in the whites of my eyes and, and told me that, and I and I respected that. Um, University of Louisville, on the other hand, uh, they came to my practices. They sent me information and in, in, in through the mail. They would call the house, and I remember, I think this was around late December, right during our playoff run. Um, they were talking about scheduling me to come in on for a visit in January. And so they were like, they're going to get back to me on the date. And 
you know, it's it's 2021 and I'm still waiting on that call back. <laughs> I guess they they they, go, they ghosted me before that was even a term. So dur dur during that time period, I remember um, being at home during Christmas break, season is over. And I'm like, you know, I don't have any offers right now. I, I'm getting a little bit of buzz, but I'm not hearing anything. And I remember I was playing, uh, 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 it was a 2000, so this was like a PlayStation 2. And I remember I paused the game and I remember I just, I just sat down in my, I was in the living room and I just like, I, just, I got on my knees and I said a prayer. And I remember I prayed, you know, I was home by myself, said a prayer. I was like, you know, God, I just want, you know, someone to, I want a, a team or a school to, to want me, to really, to truly want me, um, to, for me to uh, make an impact on the team and to play somewhere where I'm, you know, where I'm wanted. And I said some other stuff. And then like, like two or three days later, I get a call from Bethune Cookman. Uh, to this day, his name is Coach Gross. He called me. And he basically repeated the words of my prayer back to me. And he was saying, like, you know, give us a chance. We want you. You know, do you know about Bethune Cookman? And he just kind of went into a, sp a spill. And a, kind of a, a side story, I have an aunt and an uncle that are Bethune Cookman graduates. And um, they graduate like in the 80s. And they lived in Atlanta while we were in Georgia. And they would go down to the Florida Classic, drive up and stop at our house in Warner Robins on their way home. So they did this like every year during my, during my, um, my college career, but I never thought about Bethune Cookman. Um, I see, I saw Fam U play a couple times when I was younger, and but but I never thought about like like I'm gonna play HBCU football. My high school HBCUs never came to my high school, and we have two that are probably within a two hour radius of my school. None of them ever came, so I never even thought about it. But when he said that, I immediately you know kind of thought back to my interactions with my aunt and uncle. The times I saw um, you know, HBCU football, and I was like, you know what, this may be it. This may be a sign. So I, I went on my recruitment trip to um, to Bethune, um, and that's when you know, obviously met uh, you know Coach Wyatt and the whole coaching staff. And and honestly, during that time, man, you know, even now, you know, Bethune Cookman doesn't have his own stadium. You know, we we the, the the locker room was like a trailer. I mean, there was all these reasons for me to be like, you know, you know what, I'm gonna go somewhere else. But I guess in the back of my mind, I had like the, I had the Jerry Rice thing in the back of my mind during this time. Jackson State had a wide receiver that was drafted in the first round, uh, Sylvester Morris. Um, he was a first round pick, so all that was in my head. I was like, I can make this work. I know I can make it. I know I can make it work. And, um, and I think we, when I went on my visit, that was my parents' uh, anniversary. So the coaches had like flowers and balloons and, and their own suite for for them. I mean, they they really set it out. So it it, would be, it was like a kind of family atmosphere. And now this is now this is a good interesting story too. I just thought about this um, in in preparation for the day. Is when I got back from my visit, um, I was like, you know, I committed to Coach Wide in person. Got back from my visit and. I get back to school probably on that Monday or Tuesday. I get a call from the head coach to come from my head high school coach to come to the office. And I and then I get down there, open the door. My coach is sitting on on, the, on my right side and on the left side is Urban Meyer. Urban Meyer, this was he was at he was at Bowling Green. This was his stop before he went to Utah. Mm -hmm. And then you know he went from Utah to Florida. Mm -hmm. So man, Urban Meyer put the full court press on me. And I can I see why people signed signed up to play with him at Ohio State, Florida, and Utah because he was making Bowling Green sound like it was a second coming. Because <laughs> I mean he I mean he was he was in there. He was like you know you know who you remind me of. He said I've only he said I've, I've he said I've coached I've coached at Notre Dame. I coached at Ohio State, and I've seen a lot of players. You know who you remind me of. I mean he was serious. I was like who? He was like Chris Carter. I haven't seen hands like yours since Chris Carter. And he was like, and I was the wide receivers coach at Ohio State, so I, I know what I'm talking about. And like, he just he just went on, like he went on to their schedule, he went on like e everything. He was like, we're we're trying to build a you know build a team, build a you know culture, blah blah blah. So, in my infinite wisdom, you know, 18 year old self, I'm like, no, I'm not, I'm like, I'm not, I'm not going. I kept saying no, no. But but the more he was talking, the more I was like, I was like, oh, I was like, maybe maybe I could I could hear him out. And then I started defend. I started talking. I told him that you know I committed to Bethune Cookman, and I'm gonna play in the MEAC, HBCU football. And I remember him sitting back. He was like, he said, oh, he said, okay, Bethune Cookman. I'm not gonna say anything bad about Bethune Cookman. He was like, um, who are you playing your first game? I was like, I was like, I, I, at that year, I think I think we we're gonna be playing like Savannah State or somebody first game. He was like, he said Savannah State. Okay. He was like, uh, who, who who's your rival? I was like, 
Florida, Florida a &M. He's like, okay, who else are you going to play? I was like, Howard, um, North Carolina a &T. <laughs> He looked at me. He was like, our first game, Michigan. Second game, Oklahoma. We're going to be in the big house. We're going to be in Norman. He, and then he was like, I'm not saying anything against Bill Cookman, but Oklahoma and, and, and Michigan. And then he just kind of went, he just kind of went down the list. And I, and then he, as he's talking, I'm like, he got a point. He got a point. And then, and then he, and then he told me, he was like, you know, he said, you know what? He said, I'm going to come to your house tonight and I'm going to talk to your parents to see if they tell me the same thing that you're telling me. He said, if they tell me the same thing, then, um, then I'll, I'll let you, I'll let you alone with your decision and then we'll go from there. Um, but he, he was like, but I think they may tell me something different. And I was like, I was like, all right. So, um, we got up from the table. He, he walks towards the front of the locker room area. My position coach pulls me to the side and he says, he's like, Patrick, he's like, he's like I know you already committed, but he was like, he's like, you know, this is D1, you know, they're gonna be playing big name schools. He's like, this is, this is, this is what you, um, this is what you, this is where you should be at. Keep in mind at the time, I felt like from my, from my assistant coaches that they didn't necessarily have my best interest at heart during my career there. Uh, because like for me, to, you know, I only got 30 something targets um, and I, I didn't go into the, into this story. There was another re receiver at the time who they thought was going to be all everything. But by the time we got to my senior year, I eclipsed him because he had, he had talent, but he didn't work hard. Mm -hmm. So I eclipsed him and I, they didn't, they didn't like, they didn't hand out my, they didn't pass out my highlight tape back then. That was how you really kind of got recruited. They set your highlight tape up and sent it to different colleges. They didn't do any of that. So when he's telling me this, I look at him. I'm like, I'm like, oh, now you're interested in like my, my decision making process. Like this has got nothing to do with you. So I was like, I was like kind of an army of one. So I didn't I didn't even really, really even listen to him. So as I turn from the coach, I'm, I'm going to walk out and I'm thinking, I'm like, all right, if he comes to my house tonight, then I'm just going to flip. I'm, I, I, I mean, that because that, that, I was like, nobody has done that. And as soon as I get to the front door, Urban Meyer does a 180 and he just goes, he just, he just like, he's just like, you know what? We're not going to compete with a second rate school like Bethune Cookman. You know, if that's where you want to go, then that's where you can go. It's like, you know, um, there's other talent out there and I'm not going to fight over um, a, a low one double A school over talent. I'm, I'm, we're one, we're a one A school. And he just kind of just went on. He just started, he just started crapping all over Cookman wow. and HBCU ball. And I was like, I was like, all right, you're showing your true colors. So I was, I was like, I was like, F all y'all. I was like, I'm going to Cookman. <laughs> so, you know, so I, I just, I was just like, I was on my, uh, like I said, ar army of one. I, I mean, it, I, I think the only ones who I felt like kind of was in my corner during that time was like my, obviously my, my parents, my dad, and and that was like my mom and, and me. And I was like, that's all I need. I was like, I don't need any, any, anyone, anyone else, you know, so. Man, that is interesting. That is so crazy. Again, I, I, and I remember uh, Urban Meyer at Bowling Green because what he did was he recruited a lot of Florida guys um, yep. to Bowling Green, Omar Jacobs, and a lot of those guys yep. recruited yep. from Florida to, and yep. to, 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 to Bowling Green, which gave him the opportunity to go to Utah and then from Utah, of course, to Florida. So, yep. um, so yeah, I, I definitely remember that. But it's just that's so interesting to hear those conversations, uh, even the thought processes of a, a Bowling Green and what he was thinking about HBCU at that time, right? I'm not surprised to hear that you say this. These are some of the things that he said out of his, out of his mouth. So I'm not surprised <laughs> at all. Yeah, especially now. I mean, it kind of you know uh, <laughs> rose can't change its colors. So, um, but yeah, it, it, it was it was an interesting time. And then and then I heard actually on my signing day, and this is an interesting rumor. There was another. There was one of the, another assistant coach who was looking for me. The, I think the day before or the day of signing day, because they said that West Virginia was looking for me. They wanted to try to sign me at the last minute. And um, and I, I could never confirm it because I was like, you know, everybody knows where I'm at. Like mm -hmm. in, in high school, I was like, if they if, the, if they really wanted to see me, the coaches could have given me the information. They could have got to me. But I mean, it, it was like I remember like a couple coaches, they were frantic. They're like, West Virginia's looking for you. West Virginia's looking for you. I'm like. They they got my number, so I, I, but I was on this thing like you know if they wanted me by now they had all this time to get me. Yeah, I gave I gave Wyatt my my, my you know my word I'm going to Cookman. So wow, no that's 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 amazing. That's honorable too, as you mentioned. Just a lot of times kids' dreams are to go play major D one football. They want to be on TV, right? And they a lot of times quote unquote sell a soul just to have that opportunity. A lot of times right. it don't work out. They end up transferring back to a HBCU or something like that. So for you to stand right. on that, man, I that's 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 tremendous. That's honorable. Um, 
but as as you mentioned, right, you decided to go to, to Bethune Cookman uh, College at the time. Can you talk about what was the biggest adjustment from you coming from uh, Warner Robins to Daytona and, you know, going from high school to college? Man, it, it, it was an adjustment on a lot of levels. Um, I just talk about going from <clears throat> Warner Robins to Daytona. Uh, you know, Daytona, I mean, it's kind of weird to say, but going to Daytona or just Florida in general, Florida's more cultured, I would say, than, or cultural than Georgia was. I mean, you had, you know, from an ethnic standpoint, it was like you had, you know, Hispanics, Blacks, and Whites. You know, when I got to Daytona, that's when I really learned about, you know, the Caribbean vibe. You know, you had, you know, like, you know, like, Dominicans, Puerto Ricans, Haitians, and Bahamians, like all of that. And then, and everybody's proud too, you know? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you just kind of get you know, adjusting to that and just being like, you know, um, back in Florida, cause you know, my dad's from Florida. So we were on the other, on the Tampa side, mm -hmm. but, um, and then just being in the HBCU in general. And then by the time I got to, you know, college, uh, you know, uh, Cookman, you know, Cookman didn't have the best facilities um, for, from a standpoint of like relative to other, colleges so that that in itself was an, a little bit of an adjustment and um i would say like my freshman year uh, i think the i think on the field the biggest adjustment for me was um i guess how you handle a loss mm -hmm. uh, what i didn't say in my in my in my high school career i think we lost in four years eight games maybe and four of those we lost my freshman year wow. so like in three years we lost three games so for three years, when we lost the game, that was the end of the season, and, and you felt it because it was like, okay, we know, it, it, you know, we're, we're done or whatever. My freshman year, we won our first game and we lost the second game. And the second game, and when we lost, I saw people like laughing and smiling, and I'm like, what? Like, like, because when we lost, it was like, you better not in high school, you better not smile. You getting mm -hmm. getting cussed out. You getting you gonna fight because mm -hmm. like we we took it serious. So coming to coming to college, uh, seeing that, I was like, man, that's that's kind of an adjustment. Um, but um, I think we, my freshman year we lost three or four games. But then when we got into kind of the I call it kind of the run, like the O two team, the O three team, that that vibe and that culture really really shifted because we had a lot of you know good players on the team, um, had a lot of dogs on the team, like mm -hmm. you know we were <laughs> on on and off the field, <laughs> on and off the field. But I think you know. Going from high school to college, you know, there's a speed factor, like the speed of the game mm -hmm. that that was there a little bit. But I just think that, you know, um, just just changing that dynamic in high school. You know, you, you, you're in school all day, then you go to practice and then, you know, you plan you know, Friday nights and then you're planning for like your community, your area, your neighborhood. You go to a college. Um, I'm sure it's like I said, no matter what college you go to, it seemed more a little more transactional. It was like, you know, you. And more, more business. Like you, you go there, you got to perform. You, you, you do your job. You keep your role. If not, then you're going to be on the bench. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was a little more transactional, and um, but it was still fun nonetheless. How special was the 2002 Common Transfer team? Man, that, that, that team was that team was good. The 02 team and the 03 team. We really should have went back to back, but the 02 team. Just to give you some context, we had uh, Alan Suber, who was who was a junior that year. Uh, quarterback. Rasheem Mathis was a, a senior that year. That's the year he had 14 picks. Mm -hmm. um, Nick Collins, who was drafted by the Packers, didn't even start that year. He, he was a sophomore. He came off the bench. Well, actually, he came off the bench, but he played special teams. Mm -hmm. He didn't start till later in the year. Um, we had Steve Baggs, who's the all-time sack leader at Bethune-Cookman. He, he was a, a junior that year. And we had we had we had some some other some other names that I'm probably forgetting, but um, that year I think we only lost to Hampton that year because that was a game that I think Suber was was hurt in prior to that game. So we went in with a backup Julius quarterback. And, guy. Yeah, Julius Franklin. Yeah, he, he played on that team. He was a year ahead of me. Uh, so we lost that game. We were um, 11 and one. That was, that was the first time we went to the uh, uh, playoffs, and we played Georgia Southern that year. Obviously, we, we got we got beat by, um, by them, but they had a different um, offense. Um, they like just they did the wing tee, so that clock mm -hmm. just ran. I mean, four quarter game, it felt like it was over within ninety minutes. It, it was like I mean, they they kept grinding grinding the ball, but it but it, it was just it was just interesting to be on that team because you know. Um, like Rasheen, you know, he he was he was like all everything. Like I mean, fourteen picks, fourteen picks, like, bro. And he had eleven or 10, 10 or eleven as a sophomore. So 
I mean, he he, he was just he, he was just a dog. And then um, and then Nick, you know, he would Nick Howard, uh, no Eric Williams was a freshman in 03. Yeah, so this was before Eric, Eric got there. But um, but yeah, the O two team was O two team was special, man. And uh, I I really think that O three team would have been at, is is as special, but we just didn't get the get, get the ring. Man, you again that that O two team as a uh, Cookman alum and a former uh, Wildcat football player, that O two team was a, a lot of the what the uh, just kind of what was what we was compared to a lot of times. Talk about all the talent. Talk about yeah. just the success that you guys had. And as you mentioned, like Alan Suber and, and, and some of these guys who were just, you know, they put it on a lot. Like they were the guys, like they, you yeah. know what I mean? They, they carried, they, they represented and they just did so much of that legendary stuff. But the, the guy who led these teams and, and was the front man for this, you talk about our head coach, legendary Alvin shine. White. can you talk about just, you know, your experience <laughs> with him and just kind of just, you know, what, what it was like to play for him. Man, Coach Wyatt, that, that that I wish we could make a documentary on that time oh, period because some of the stuff that the, some of the stuff that I am recalling, <laughs> it, it, it seems like that like someone made it up. But you had to be there. I mean, this 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 man was like I mean, look, so like I like I can start anywhere. Let's just talk about the man first from a from a dress standpoint. Yes, this 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 guy during games and practice, he would dress like like this. In practice, mm-hmm. he would have a he have a gold watch on, a gold bracelet, cowboy boots, some some pants with a belt buckle, and he out there in Florida Heat coaching during during the week, mm-hmm. and and we like how come we can't just get a regular coach that dressed like his shorts, a hat, a shirt, <laughs> all the other assistants like that, but he but he out there with his with his shirt unbuttoned, mm-hmm. talking about talking about he can he can hold a cup with his chest, like he, <laughs> like I mean he walking around practice like that. <laughs> so then, you, then we get to a game, you know, whether we in at home or whether we are on the road. My man coming out in a Burberry j- jacket, matching boots. Uh, sometimes he had a spur on the back. You know, uh, he he was he was dressed every game. And uh, so from that standpoint, it was just it was just so funny to like see. After a while, we just got used to it. But you know, others they would just say, you know, he's like the best dressed coach in college football because he always dressed just dressed good. But um, but as far as like motivation, man, Coach Watt can motivate any anyone or anybody to run through a brick wall. Yes. And uh, and I think he, I think that was like his strong suit that he really was good at at um, you know, give. I don't want to say necessarily giving speeches, but he would just he would just get us ready for a game. Like he made us believe that we could beat anybody, mm-hmm. particularly coming from Cookman, you know, uh, one of the smaller schools within the MEAC at the time. And he was just like, you know, uh, whoever we line up and play, he said, I don't care who's on the schedule, we play, we beat them. Mm-hmm. And uh, he he always he used to have all these different sayings. He had, um, I'm trying to think what, what he used to say uh, to us. How you um, fire? Hot. How you fire? <laughs> how you fire? Who the boss? Who the boss? <laughs> um, uh, who the boss? And uh, he used to call us dream killers. Mm-hmm. Um, he used to call that all the time. Uh, champs, call us champs all the time. And uh, he did, he just made, he just made us really believe in ourselves. And an, an, another thing that he used to do, uh, well, well these this are kind of probably some uh, some funny stories I got a little bit. Is uh, when we were on the when we uh, were doing pregame meals um, before games, he was very adamant that no one eats sweets or dessert or um, or, or bread because he said that makes you slow. So I forget what game we were at. I think we were on the road, and there was this office, this office lineman. Uh, and because we would eat by, he would go for like first string O, mm-hmm. would get up and go first, first string D, second string or whatever. But one of the linemen, they they got had a bright idea, and they got like, I think it was like some strawberry shortcake or something. They tried to hide it, and but but Coach Wyatt, was, as we're eating, he's like kind of like walk around the periphery. <laughs> and so the guy was like trying to sneak it, and then he walks behind him, and then he stands up over him, and he just puts his hand in the, and just mushes the cake. He just goes and just does like this. He, he just looks at him. He's like, <coughs> he said, "I told y'all about getting that bread. I want to make y'all pay." He just licks his, he just licks his, his fingers. But you can't laugh though. You can't laugh. So we, we we in there like this, <coughs> doing like this. And he said, "Y'all gonna pay. Y'all gonna pay." And so we get back to practice the next day. And we used to run these uh, sprints after practice. It was like maybe like 40, 50 yard sprints. Mm-hmm. 
And we get back on there. He was like, I'm making somebody quit today. Somebody's going to give up their scholarship. And he just sprinted. Us. I mean, we're just sprinting back, back and forth, back and forth. And he didn't stop until somebody quit. And then, wow. like, when they quit the team and walked off, he was like, okay, now we're done. Yeah. I mean, like, he, like, he, he was, he was, he was hardcore, man. Wow. He was like, yeah, it, it was, uh, Man, it's so many. It's so many. It's so that, many that was one of the stories. That's one of the, one of the urban legends about how many uh, wind sprints or gases y'all ran that day. Like people talk about that, and we'll, we'll talk about that even when I was there about how much he made y'all run nonstop. Um, I got a, a similar story, Dre. This is crazy. Again, this he one of our linemen uh, uh, got some ice cream and he did the same thing. <laughs> Stuck his finger in the ice cream, right? And, and and told him, you know, and told him, you know, what I told y'all about these sweets. So <laughs> we another time we had the Florida Classic and uh, they had these little like little sweet like cornbread balls or something or whatever. Right. So we were we, we, we snuck some at our table. We got them. So we was able to to, to to finish. So he came by on our table. It was it was a plate. He put his hand on the plate, picked it up to taste to see what was on it. And we just knew it was over. We was like, oh, man, this man, of course. <laughs> but he would do stuff like that, Dre. It was the crazy. You can't wow. laugh. Like Patrick said, you cannot laugh. You can't make it up. You, oh, can't, you better not laugh. You better not laugh. <laughs> oh, man. I, this dude was on. He, he. I remember one time. So, there's a, so well, I, I got another story. So, on the sprints, Jeff, I think the record, at least when I was there, was 67. Mm. So, and, and Dre, um, so how the sprint goes, we would we used to line up like in, in I guess, rows of like 10. Mm -hmm. And when they blow the whistle, like the first line gets down like kind of in a ready stance and then they put the hand in the ground. And then when that whistle blows, that first line runs off. And as soon as they get about maybe five yards, that's the, they blow the whistle again, that second line goes. So by the time the last line finishes, that first line is already down, ready to run. So you don't really have that much of a break. Mm -hmm. And then in the front of the line, he put the offensive lineman up first, like the big boys. So by the time they get there and turn around, the sprinters were already passing them. So they got to turn around. So there's not much of a break. We did that 67 times Whoa. after practice, 67. And, and, and some days he wouldn't, he wouldn't, he would not stop until somebody either threw up or somebody quit. And, like, and he was for real. He was like, he's like, we're, he said, today we're gonna break a record today. <laughs> <laughs> and, blow and we just running up. And then, and then, and then sometimes we got so I guess used to it, we would we would like dare him to keep us keep running, like keep going, coach, keep going. Like we would like we were kind of like kind of bucking up against it. But he he was just on he was on something else. One other quick story I, I, I'll say is um, <clears throat> I think one game this may have been 02, Now I'm thinking about it, either 02 or 03, We had a so. During home games, we used to stay in day we during that time we stayed in uh um not, not Daytona but uh Orman. the land. Oh yeah, no, no, what was it? Well, no, well, we, Orman, we stayed Orman. in Ormond. We stayed in Ormond. Yeah, we stayed in Ormond. But this particular weekend we stayed in the land. I forgot I forgot what the what the reasoning was. And um so we, we stayed in the land. We went to a, a restaurant pregame meal somewhere in the land. So we're taking I-4 back to the to the uh, stadium to play the game. And I think at the time we only had one cop car that was in front of the bus kind of like guiding us, but we were running into traffic on our four coach wise in a drop top convertible next to the, next to the, uh, to the, to the uh, police car. He's getting mad at the police because the police isn't stopping traffic. So my man whips in the middle of our four, he does like a donut in the middle of our four and he gets out of his car and does like this to traffic. traffic no way. Stops. No and way. He start, he, and he, and he's doing this to the, uh, to the buses coming through. He did that like twice. I, 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 swear to God, I looked at the one. I was like, this man is crazy. And we got we got to the game on time because if he wouldn't have done that, we would have been late. You know, I, it, now I think about it. it may have, I don't know if it, it may have been homecoming. Maybe he wanted us out of that out of that area. But <laughs> we this, did that yeah, too. Once he, we, we stayed, we stayed in we stayed in um it might have been um uh, uh Altamont Springs or something, but we stayed doing homecoming. He wanted us away. So we did that yeah. once before as well. So um that that, that might have been it. But I never heard that story. He stopped yeah. high full traffic. He, he stopped traffic. He stopped traffic. <laughs> <laughs> and they used to have this thing. I don't know if they had this when you were there, Jeff. Um that you know when the when um freshmen come in for the season, you know, you, you had like three games to play mm -hmm. um before you get red shirted. Yeah. And so if you got designated a red shirt, um there was this, uh, I guess, urban legend or myth, or just kind of understanding that we were like, if you're if you're a freshman and you're red shirted and you're dressed out, 
do not stand by Coach Wyatt because he will burn that shirt. Yes, yes. And, and what they and it happened. I think it happened to I think the class before me. They said it was like game seven or game eight of the of the, um, of the season. And this freshman was next to him, fully dressed out, had a helmet on everything. And he grabbed him and threw him in the game because I guess he got mad at somebody and he just burned his shirt. So his eligibility was gone just like that. So everybody knew who was redshirt. I didn't redshirt, but some of the other ones, they were like saying that, you know, they, they, would, audit, they would on purpose leave their helmet on the mm-hmm. other side of the bench and, and walk next to him. And then they would say, he would say, hey, I want, you know, 81, get in the game. He's like, coach, I ain't got my helmet. And, he, and coach would cuss him out or whatever and then get the next person in. But uh, at least he kept his eligibility. Yeah. But yeah. Um, yeah. No, he had that, that, that a lot of stories like that. That was something that continued because uh, I remember as a quarterback late in the season, got his shirt burnt. Um, so, so, so that same conversation, stay away from him if you don't want to get your shirt burnt. <laughs> 100% accurate. Yep. <laughs> yep.